Hello, Peter. Oh, I get it. We're doing like a multiverse thing, aren't we? Whether it be movies, television, comics, or even books and theater, the idea of doppelgangers, parallel dimensions, multiple worlds existing, they've all been around forever. But while we understand the implications and definition of the concept, how would an actual multiverse work in relation to space and metaphysics, the laws and rules of nature? As much as we love to engross ourselves in media about the subject, we don't really think much about the actuality of it, the science and cosmic phenomena that its existence depends on. Well, I did think about it, and started to look into things. I read research papers, journal articles, some old tomes from across the world to learn more about the history and, more importantly, the practicality of multiverse theory. Now here I am, two months later, with a headache and a script, and it's time to figure out if either of those two things were worth the journey. So buckle on in, put your learning caps on, and get ready for what may be the most strange and possibly incoherent journey you'll ever embark on. Oh, and before I forget, if you like the video and want me to cover more of this subject or similar concepts, why don't you leave a comment down below and subscribe. Now enough with the shameless plugs, let's get this metaphysical party started! Like a lot of modern science, philosophy, and thought, we have to start this field trip all the way back in ancient Greece, specifically around 400 BC. During this time, we find a group of thinkers known as the Atomists, believers in a concept advocated for by the philosopher Democritus of Thrace. Atomists believed in an ever-present space surrounding everything known as the Void, a physical space that encompasses all of existence. Within the void, void entities known as atoms combine and scatter around, assembling in different formations to compose matter. The base theory of atomism was actually proposed by Democritus' teacher Lysippus, but Democritus was the one who refined and systematized the concept. As part of the theory, it was explained since the atoms that drift around the void can only combine, atoms are an ever-present entity in the universe that can't be destroyed but only recombine into different arrangements of matter. Yet, if at any time these atoms should collide with one another, an event similar to the Big Bang could occur. The resulting matter explosion creates a world parallel to ours but imperfect in various ways. Does all of this sound kind of familiar? Well, uh, the first part about atoms, not the parallel world stuff. Part of Lucipus' original atom theory stated that there were an infinite number of atoms that exist within the universe, which in turn means that the universe is an infinite void. Around 170 years later, Chrysippus of Soli attempted to elaborate upon this idea with his own hypothesis and gave rise to Stoicism. Chrysippus and the Stoics believed that there was a fixed number of atoms within the universe, and that number remained a constant. However, he hypothesized that the universe was in a perpetual state of death and rebirth, being destroyed and created for all eternity, with this fixed number of atoms always existing and recombining into these different iterations of the universe. This was one of the first ideas that would give rise to the thought experiment of multiple universes existing, but not necessarily a multiverse, as these multiple iterations never occurred simultaneously, but rather chronologically. As the world of thought continued to develop, some thinkers took a more pious and spiritual approach. Circa 1093, Persian polymath Iman Muhammad Ghazili, or Al Ghazili, supposed that the universe's existence wasn't necessary in the grand scheme of things, but rather that God had given us a gift by choosing to create the world. Because of this, humanity should be grateful that he chose to create our world out of the infinite number he could have possibly created. After Al-Ghazili's death in 1111, fellow theologian and jurist Ibn Rushd rebutted this belief. He stated that although God created our world, it was out of necessity rather than kindness. With this necessity being taken into mind, he said it was very well possible that any other worlds God could have thought of may have been actualized as well, although we may not be worthy to receive or perceive that knowledge due to our sin. Approximately a century later in the High Middle Ages, the subtle doctor John Duns Scotus was drafting his second write-up on Aristotelian philosophy called the Questione Super Libros Metaphysicorum Aristotelis. In this collection, Scotus picked apart and postulated different theories in regards to metaphysics and state of being. 
he wrote about the idea of universals, or realities that are observable or non-observable, using philosophers as examples. He pondered that if Plato and Socrates are both human men, is there something about our non-observable reality that repeats in order for us to perceive this to be true, or are there no true commonalities between the men? He questioned if an object's hexiety, a sort of aura that allows a thing to be unique and distinct from another, communicated with or was related to an extramental space, a different universal known as the common nature. So for the comparison between Plato and Socrates, the common nature of humanity existed within both, but it was the men's hexiates that made them unique. Where it connects to multiverse theory is in the idea that there were hundreds of thousands, if not an infinite number of common natures, and these unobservable universals act as ethereal qualifiers for everything in existence being invoked from their extramental space or universe. There were plenty of other thinkers, cultures, and religions that pondered similar questions, but at the end of the day, most of them are pretty similar to what we've already seen thus far. It should be noted, however, that most of these theories were developed independently from one another without prior knowledge of each other. A unique and interesting happenstance, indeed. Our last stop on the tour shows us four centuries forward into the 17th century to visit Gottfried Leibniz. While Gottfried's ideas were seen as groundbreaking and unique for the time, they actually had a lot in common with Al-Ghazali and Ibn Rushd's speculations. What Leibniz called the best of all possible worlds idea, he believed that God could have conceived an infinite number of different universes from ours, however he chose to create ours as the best possible outcome. This idea was created as part of his book, Essais de Théodicie, c'est la bonté de Dieu, la liberté de l'homme et l'origine du mal, in an attempt to explain the famous problem of evil question in philosophy. So, how exactly does this history lesson connect to the multiverse, you may be asking? Flash forward to the 1800s when John Dalton developed atomic theory after the proper discovery of atoms. From this point, scientists began to better understand the world, how things were comprised of atoms and the even smaller particles that compose those. As our understanding of the structure of the universe grew, we began to apply this understanding to different aspects of the world we lived in, including the ever-expanding universe that surrounded us. Who am I? What am I? Near the turn of the century, in 1895, American philosopher William James penned the term multiverse for the first time. Yet we're still not at the inception of what we would come to understand as the definition of the term. James's multiverse was actually a term used to describe the nature of life, death, and purpose in relation to nature. He wrote in his book, Is Life Worth Living?, quote, Truly all we know of good and duty proceeds from nature, which is all plasticity and indifference, a moral multiverse as one might call it." End quote. It may not be the word as we know it now, but at least it was out in the world. Now hold on, because we're almost at the end. In 1963, the word reappeared in the science fiction novel The Sundered Worlds, written by Michael Moorcock. This is when the word took the form we're all familiar with, that being a hypothetical area in which our universe is only one of a greater, interconnected space of dimensions or universes. I couldn't find an exact source for how Moorcock found or penned the word, so I'm not entirely sure whether he borrowed the phrase from Dalton or if it was independently created without prior knowledge. Regardless, the concept took shape into the pop culture idea it is now. Although the idea of the multiverse is now popularized, there are still different theories and hypotheses that argue over the proper definition and classification of what could be considered to constitute a multiverse. The idea relies often, but not always, on the possible existence of more than one universe existing concurrent to ours, but there's no solidified evidence as to how that could happen outside of theoretical equations. As a result, we'll look at the two most popular classification schemes to understand the different theoretical types of the multiverse better, how they're formed, and what they're comprised of. The first classification scheme was outlined by cosmologist Max Tegmark, and looks at the theory as one that's expanded from the material of our own observable universe. Tegmark's scheme is comprised of four levels, each of which builds upon the previous level's rules and details. At the end of each level, I'll try and give a simplified explanation to the best of my understanding, just for the sake of y'all at home retaining some sort of knowledge. Level 1 is the infinite extension of our universe. Our universe, as we know it, is constantly expanding as a result of the initial production of matter. As a three-dimensional shape, it's stretching and growing in every which way and expanding its theoretical borders. What we can see within this area using technology is known as the observable universe. 
the space of the observable universe is known as a Hubble volume, the name given to the internal viewable area. The limit of a Hubble volume is that the full vastness of the universe can never be observed, as it's expanding faster than the speed of light could reach a viewer. But as the universe expands, it creates more internal volume within itself, meaning that multiple Hubble volumes could be formed in different locations. Hence, with constant expansion, different observable Hubble volume points are created, ergo an infinite number of volumes exist within the universe. The best way I can describe it is sort of as a Venn diagram. I know, ugh, more real educational stuff. If an observer's point is within the center of one circle of the diagram, and another observer is in the center point of the opposite circle, they're both seeing different Hubble volumes in relation to their positions. They may interweave, but there's still different volumes, different viewpoints within the universe. And in this first level of classification, that infinite expansion could be defined as a building block of a multiverse. Level 2 is pocket dimensions with different physical constants. In the second level, it's posited that as a result of this cosmic inflation and expansion, it's more likely for spontaneous symmetry breaking to occur at different points in the expanding universe. Essentially, spontaneous symmetry breaking is what would happen if somehow the formulas for the laws of physics and nature were rewritten. These areas where spontaneous symmetry breaking occurs could be classified as embryonic pocket or bubble universes within our own universe, as they're now subject to different physical constants like the speed of light and gravity in a contained area. In its simplest form, the expansion of the universe means things are more likely to go wonky in places, and these places become their own contained pocket universes. Level 3 is the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. Arguably the most popular aspect of multiverse theories, this is where the idea of parallel universes and alternate timelines come from. This level was assimilated by Tegmark from the many worlds theory by Hugh Everett III, which was in turn an answer to the paradox of a thought experiment put forth by Erwin Schrödinger. You may be familiar with the Schrodinger's cat thought experiment, one in which a cat is placed in a box with a source of radiation and a flask of poison. If an internal sensor detects radiation, the flask is broken and the poison kills the cat. However, without being able to see inside the box, the observer is unable to determine what the outcome will be, if the cat is alive or dead, meaning that all possibilities are simultaneously occurring. That was a poor explanation, but I think you kinda get the point. Everett's Many Worlds theory took this experiment and said that since both occurrences in Schrodinger's experiment have happened, there are two existing versions of the universe in which both possibilities play out. The Many Worlds theory implies that any feasible outcome of an action or diversion still occurs in an alternate world or universe, despite not occurring in our observable space. How this fits in with the scheme to make this third level, Tegmark argues that the bubble universes with different physical constants are formed or split off from our universe as the diversions create the spontaneous symmetry breaking that forms the pocket universes. In more straightforward terms, one of the most popular examples to go to is the community episode Remedial Chaos Theory. In the episode, the study group rolls a six-sided die to determine who will go get the pizza delivery from downstairs in Troy and Abed's apartment. We're shown the possible outcomes, depending on which number the die lands on and which person leaves, resulting in different outcomes for each scenario. Each time the die lands on a different number, Tegmark would argue a different pocket universe is bored in which the alternate versions of the characters we're seeing at that point live. Level 4 is the ultimate ensemble. Level 4 is ultimately Tegmark's way of wrapping up the concept in a neat little bow, stating that if a hypothetical existing universe is describable by a mathematical structure, then there's a possibility that it's equally as real in existence as ours. Of course, it's a bit more complicated than that in detail, but uh, that's the final level in its essence. While Tegmark's classification scheme attempts to explain the existence of any kind of multiverse under one roof, the second scheme says, Hey, we don't know how any of this might work, so here's just a list of all the ways we theorized it could work. This second schema was developed by physicist Brian Greene and mainly lists off the ideas proposed by other folks rather than trying to mash them all together into one justifiable working lump. Greene's nine classifications of possible multiverses are found within his 2011 novel The Hidden Reality, Parallel Universes, and The Deep Laws of the Cosmos. It begins with a few familiar ideas, specifically the inflationary, landscape, cyclic, and quantum models. The inflationary model is, in its essence, levels 2 and 3 of Tegmark's scheme, with different pockets forming within the expanding universe and creating these alternate spaces. 
The landscape model is also very similar to the inflationary model and consequentially level 2 as well. Where this model differs is that it uses the string theory concept of Calabi Yau spaces. In string theory, a Calabi Yau space is a type of space that exists in an area of the expanding universe in which different universal properties and laws exist in a six dimensional space. The landscape model theorizes that the Calabi Yau spaces are created within the expanse when quantum fluctuation, a change of energy in a particular point of space time, occurs. The cyclic version has similarities with theories going all the way back to Chrysippus, viewing the multiverse not always as a collection of different interconnected spaces, but a chronological death and rebirth of different variations of the universe. Within the cyclic model, there are also different concepts to explain the death and rebirth, such as loop quantum cosmology and conformal cyclic cosmology. There's only one theory that applies to the cyclic model that's also included in this list, the brain theory, so we'll touch upon that in a second. The last familiar face is the quantum model. The quantum version is basically an alternate name given to the many worlds interpretation, where a diversion or split in actions or events creates different branches where all possibilities occur, despite not being observable within our universe. Now for the semi-familiar, we'll talk about brain cosmology theory since it's connected to the cyclic model. Brain cosmology is actually a collection of multiple different theories that all connect to string theory and particle physics, but I'll just be sticking to what's applicable to this topic. The brain theory in Green's list is centered around the idea of multiple universes existing at once as three-dimensional spaces, each one contained within a special sort of outer casing known as a brain. These brain-enclosed universes exist within a higher plane of space, similar to the Grecian concept of the void, this time known as the bulk. Within the bulk, there are a possible infinite amount of encapsulated universes floating around, where it connects to the cyclic model and Chrysippus's ideas, it actually connects itself to Democritus's and Lysippus's theories as well. Much like Lysippus's idea of colliding atoms creating a universal birth, it's posited that if any of these brain-contained universes were to collide with one another, it might generate enough energy to produce a similar Big Bang-esque event, birthing another universe but at the risk of possibly destroying the two or more originals that had collided. As a result, within the bulk, universes are constantly created and destroyed to create that cyclical cycle that seems to be so popular. Moving away from the still semi-familiar to complete strangers, up next is the quilted model. A relatively simple idea, the quilted can only exist if the universe continues to expand infinitely. With an infinite amount of space present to be occupied, it's more than likely that other universes could theoretically be formed and take up residence within this ever-expansive space and exist in tandem with ours. However, much like with the Hubble volume issue, with an infinitely expanding universe, the constrictions of the speed of light make these distant neighboring universes unobservable. For probably the most complicated to explain of the nine, there is the holographic multiverse. Relying heavily on the principles of string theory, a holographic multiverse would play much more within the existing space of our universe rather than what's expanding outward now. I'll try my best with this one, just like I have with the rest, but this is probably the hardest without a lot of knowledge about a bunch of other principles and laws. From what I've gathered, a holographic multiverse would rely on the idea that the volume of an ordinary mass is non-existent but instead is only perceived by observers to exist as a sort of projection or hologram. The data for this projection is encoded within the boundaries of masses that exist within the universe, meaning that each mass holds a specific code that defines its holographic volume. Then, if that mass is altered or changed, the code would also change, creating alternate perceptions of that pre-existing mass. The best way I could describe it in simpler terms would be to think of a telescoping layer of different planes. The first plane at the bottom is a two-dimensional space, one that holds all the data or code that creates the universe. Then this code is projected out onto other planes, building up and arranging the code in the proper format it needs to be displayed in order to create the three-dimensional space we see. Uh, sort of like a shadow puzzle that works in reverse. The original plane, the shadow in this case, has the correct shape that makes up the rest of the planes in the universe. The three-dimensional shape, or shapes, that parallel the shadow may look like a jumble of different shapes with no correct form, but when looked at from a certain way is dictated by the shadow, you're able to see everything created by it. 
but if the shadow changes even slightly, the shapes become an alternate version of themselves. Does that make sense? I hope it does. Uh, at least sorta. I don't know if string theorists watch this or I'll be torn apart like the existence of light on the event horizon of a black hole. For a more simple to understand and again kind of familiar concept, the simulated multiverse is precisely what it sounds like. The universe we exist in is purely a simulation. How the simulation is being processed? We may never know. Maybe by some sort of quantum computer or external entity. Whatever the case, the simulation would be indistinguishable or near indistinguishable from reality. And if it's plausible that our reality is being simulated, would it not be conceivable that other realities are being processed in tandem with ours? I always thought this model was interesting because unlike the others where the different existences may be theorized to be connected in some way, it's possible that the simulated universes exist completely without connection to one another other than the processes creating them. And at long last, the final of the nine models of the multiverse, we have the ultimate multiverse model. Just like before, Tegmark's levels return, this time level four. The ultimate multiverse or ultimate ensemble idea concludes that any universe has the possibility to exist as long as it's deemed mathematically suitable according to that reality's laws of physics and mechanics. So pretty much the exact same as level four. And that's both classification schemes done and over with. I don't know about you, but my brain f***ing hurts. <sighs> of course, consider yourself lucky you're not the one who was subjected to two months of this. Well, I guess I was the one who elected to do it in the first place. Still though, there's so much more to talk about that I haven't been able to cover. Hell, I didn't even get a chance to cover all the original reasons I wanted to talk about this. And of course, all of this is so much more complicated than what I tried to simplify it down to. But if I cover every detail, where does it stop, you know? Damn it, we really only covered some of the history in the more popular theories. Maybe I'll just have to come back to this another time. Let me know if y'all want more of this topic or something about it in particular. I hope that it was at least semi-enjoyable. I think that's about all I can do for right now. I'm gonna go take some Advil and sleep until this headache goes away. Hey, thanks for watching and making it all the way here to the end. Here's your second reminder to leave a like and subscribe if you like the video. <laughs> I hope you did at least somewhat, otherwise you probably wouldn't have made it this far. Shout out to all the sources that were super great in helping me learn this information. If I got anything wrong, it's probably not their fault. If you have any suggestions for video topics or just want to say hi, I'm on Twitter at the Arcwielder. Thanks again. Your support means the world to me. Remember that we're all human, and you're important and doing your best. And that's all that matters. Take it easy, y'all.